Hello, it's Scott Manley here. And it's been quite a year for fans of planes and movies because Top Gun 2 Maverick has been the biggest thing at the box office and it seemed to be just showing forever. However, in the last week, there was a comment by a certain uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson about some uh, problems that he saw with the script. And you know what? That's fine. You can pick apart movies and have fun. But one thing I want to take issue with is when he said that, he, and I quote, when Maverick ejected at Mach 10.5, he was going 7,000 miles per hour, giving him 400 million joules of kinetic energy, the explosive power of 100 kilograms of TNT, a situation that human physiology is not designed to survive. So no, Maverick does not walk away from this. He be dead. Very dead. And I'm here to say no. Because the thing is, the fundamental mistake that he makes here is that it's not the amount of energy you have, but how quickly you lose that energy and under what circumstances. And a more extreme version of this is an astronaut going on a spacewalk outside the space station. Well, the space station is moving at Mach 25, but there's not enough atmosphere up there to really make you experience those forces in a way that could potentially hurt you. Now, there's two things to deal with. There's the, the forces from the aerodynamic pressure and there's the temperature. And you might think, well, ejecting at Mach 10 is clearly worse than ejecting at Mach 1. But the thing is, dynamic pressure is proportional to velocity squared and the atmospheric pressure. So if you go up in the atmosphere, the atmosphere atmospheric pressure goes down, and it could actually be better. Now, we don't know what altitude this uh, scene is flown at, right? We can sort of guess from a few camera angles and there's some garbage text here and there that might provide clues. But if you have Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020, there's free DLC for it, which lets you fly F-18s down canyons really fast, which I like doing, but also lets you fly the Dark Star fly it coast to coast in 20 minutes, and it does at an altitude of 120,000 feet. So if we use that as our baseline, 120,000 feet, the temperature is like, you know, 170 Kelvin, and the atmospheric pressure is 0.4% of sea level. So now, if you imagine someone ejecting at Mach 1 at sea level, they're going to be, and, and someone ejecting at Mach 10 at uh, 120,000 feet. Well, Mach 10 V squared is a hundred times, but atmospheric pressure is 0.4%. So ejecting at Mach 10 at 120,000 feet has less dynamic pressure, right? The Q, right? And you know, you know what max Q comes from, right? Q is dynamic pressure. is actually lower. So the aerodynamic forces somebody ejecting at that speed and altitude is lower than somebody ejecting at sea level. And there have been many people that have ejected supersonic at sea level or pretty close to it. So it's safe to say that those forces are survivable given a suitable escape system. Now, by suitable escape system, usually uh, pilots that are in the aircraft that allow them to eject at these altitudes, they have restraints that will pull their arms and legs into place because if the seat moves, you know, twist around you. The last thing you want is to eject up and have your arm go into an airstream and then get ripped off by the aerodynamic forces. So they pull them in. It also helps like when you're ejecting out a cockpit not to be holding on to things. <laughs> so anyway, that's fine. If you look at the X-15, right, it has, has these similar capabilities and it also has fins on its uh, ejection system that hold the seat facing forwards. Now, the other problem is a bit harder to deal with, and that is the thermals. The fact is you're moving hard into an airstream, and as it comes close to you, it forms a bow shock. It slows down, and basically you're converting all the kinetic energy into temperature. Now, again, the temperature goes as a factor of T squared, and, well, if you do the math, you can guess that the temperatures there are about 3,000 to 4,000 Celsius. And there's a lot of you know slop in this. What we're really measuring is the temperature at the shock wave in front of the object, the bow shock, and the temperature that reaches you may be different. 
So because there's a whole lot of convection and that happens on there. So that is pretty hard to survive, to be blasted in the face by, you know, 3000 degrees Celsius air. Having said that, you know, they did build the ejection seat for the F-14, F, sorry, the X-15, and it could happily handle, you know, Mach 4 or possibly above by just having the person in a pressure suit and the pressure suit insulating them against a lot of the heat for long enough that they could decelerate. However, I don't think that's what's going on here. I think that if you are an amazing aircraft designer that can build an aircraft with dual mode propulsion, with regular engines and scramjets, and you can build an aircraft with a thermal protection system that can handle Mach 10, then you probably have the skills to build a, a cockpit escape system, right? So there are aircraft that are designed for these high velocity escapes. And what they do is they basically encapsulate the pilot inside a little cocoon of some sort. Now, there's two forms that this comes in. One is like the, the B-58 Hustler, where the ejection system has a hard shell that gets pulled down during the ejection. Like, I think the ejection system is you grab the curtain and you pull it down and it locks around you and then it ejects. And that's like a little escape pod that you're in. Now, there's a story about how they tested this and there's images showing them testing these ejection capsules with a bear on board. Now, I don't think you can see the bear inside, but yeah, bear gets shot out. I think the bear was like drugged up and strapped into the seat and ejected. And yeah, the bear survived just fine. Like, you know, land walks around, didn't show any observable differences. And then the, phew, the people involved with the test were like, nope, we're going to have to autopsy that bear and make sure there's nothing injuries. So yeah, bear would have been fine if not for the autopsy. Not quite a funny picture anymore, is it? Anyway, the other side of things is where you just eject the entire cockpit. And an example of this would be like the F-111, which has a rocket motor that brings the cockpit out with two crew members, and then it drops under a parachute and lands under airbags. Another example of a cockpit escape system was the X-2, the successor to the X-1, obviously. And in that case, the whole cockpit comes out, but it that doesn't have a parachute all on its own. It sort of falls and then the pilot has the ability to sort of extract himself and parachute down. But in either case, those would both work because what you're trying to do is protect the crew of the Dark Star during this initial departure into this incredibly high temperature airstream so that the dynamic forces can slow them down to parachute deployment speed and then either there's a, a secondary ejection system to get them safely out or, you know, Maverick just pops up in the canopy and you know, parachutes down on his own. Obviously, none of this was covered because, well, it was a cooler scene to just have them disappearing into the sky and then walk into the cafe there. Yeah, I don't think that there's any real meat in Neil's discussion here, right? This is a technological problem that can, could be solved and has been solved previously. At least, you know, compared to trying to build a plane that flies at Mach 10. However, one part of the movie that doesn't make sense, if you're going to be a nitpicker, is the fact that they made a turn over Colorado and Wyoming. So, you know, they take off from California, fly over Nevada and Utah, and then they decide to make this U-turn to come back. And the radius of that turn is pretty large. You know, it's kind of the turn that a, 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 a SR-71 would make. But, you know, SR-71 is a rather pedestrian aircraft by comparison, only flies at Mach 3. Now, if you keep the radius of curvature the same and increase the speed, the g-forces you experience go up as a factor of velocity squared. So, this thing would have to experience more than 10 times the g-forces that the SR-71 did to make that turn. Now, I sort of took a look at the map and tried to figure out how big a turn it is. I think it's maybe a 150 kilometer radius turn, and that would put the g-loading at about 7 g's. And while pilots can sustain 7Gs for, you know, a short amount of time, you know, they can work at it, they can handle it, 
very quickly your body becomes tired and persistent or like long-term sustained 7G's vertical, it will knock you out. <laughs> like, even if you're a movie hero. So yeah, he doesn't make that turn. He, he should have made a much bigger turn and he would be just fine. But that turn they made, no wonder the thing failed. Right? <laughs> because he was going through this turn with very high wing loading and when he rolled out, suddenly the plane wanted to go fast. That was the moment that things went wrong. Anyway, yeah, look, uh, this was just me shooting, uh, making up stuff, thinking about stuff. It's just kind of funny to, to experiment with these. If you have not played uh, Microsoft Flight Sim 2020, you should definitely go and check out that stuff. It's uh, great. Uh, if you've not seen Top Gun, I'm going to say I quite enjoyed that movie, obviously. You know, if you're not a fan of military stuff, then that may not be your kind of thing. I saw one forum thread where Top Gun 2 was described as high order aviation porn and, and hilariously I saw somebody respond saying obviously the kind of porn for people that like ugly people and I think the person that responded must have been an F-35 pilot you know I, I have nothing against the F F-18 right <laughs> anyway yes I'm Scott Manley fly safe